You're listening to ADHD Support Talk. ADHD Support Talk is brought to you by addclasses.com. Visit addclasses.com to sign up for helpful online resources and events today. Well, I want to welcome you back to ADHD Support Talk. I'm your co-host, Lynn Idris, and I am a productivity coach. So I help overwhelmed professionals reduce procrastination, improve their time management, and get more done with less effort so that they have more time, more energy, and more money for the things that matter the most to them. Guys, you know, I'm a woman with ADHD myself, and I have been where so many of my clients are, and I have come out the other side, so to speak. I always say you can't cure ADHD, but you sure can learn to live well with it. So I understand that constant state of chaos and underperformance that so many of you are struggling with. And I really do know and believe to the core of who I am, that you can come out the other side yourself and live whatever version of success and fulfillment you want. You can learn more about me, what I do, and the programs and services I offer at www.coachingadvantages.com. And when you text the keyword, my quiz, no spaces, to 33777, you'll get complimentary access to my online productivity breakthrough quiz, where I'll help you identify your productivity type and get to the root of what gets in your way so that you can stop struggling, take control, and show up like the incredible person you really are more easily and more consistently. So I am really excited today. I have Colleen Cashman with me. And in a moment, we're going to talk about something really important. We're going to talk about maladaptive coping mechanisms in ADHD. And in particular, we're going to talk about alcohol. So welcome, Colleen. Welcome to the podcast. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about you, where they can learn more about what you do and reach out to yeah. you? Lynn, it's so good to be here. I appreciate you having me. So I'm Colleen Cashman, and I am a drinking coach. I help high achieving professional women reduce their alcohol consumption by 80% so they don't have to quit. And I have a podcast called It's Not About the Alcohol, and you can find me on TikTok and Instagram as The Hangover Whisperer. So <laughs> I help people change the maladaptive uh, part of alcohol and then restore it to more of an occasional pleasure instead of the soul sucking problem that for me is what, how, how I ended up knowing how to do all of this. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And where can uh, TikTok and Instagram are the best yeah. places for them to see you and your work and learn more about what you do. Awesome. And the podcast. Yeah. And the podcast as well. So where do you want to jump in Colleen? I mean, there are a lot of maladaptive coping mechanisms that we can develop when yeah. we have ADHD. And I had a lot of them. I was not diagnosed. I tried them all actually. Yeah. So if anybody needs any advice, I tried them all, but I was not diagnosed with ADHD until I was about 38. Okay. And so I was trying to get through life, trying to solve the problem that was my unique brain with external coping mechanisms. Yes. And I was a high performing perfectionist. I lived in survival mode. I was very stressed. And so I needed or thought I needed something to turn off my mind because I didn't understand that I was able to control my mind. So I was right. constantly looking for an antidepressant. That's how I got my diagnosis is I went okay. through all of them that has ever, ever been advertised. <laughs> and my doctor's like, I feel like we might not be dealing with the problem here. And so she diagnosed the ADHD and that really provided a turning point for me in my life. But what got me into alcohol, I was a heavy daily drinker for over 15 years. I look back now and think, how in the God's name did I manage to function? I had four kids, three step kids. I taught how power yoga and ran the marathons and coached and did all the things. And yet I had this secret shameful habit in the evening wow. because I believed that I needed that. And I understood that there were probably wasn't good for my health. I didn't love waking up with, you know, a hangover here and there, but for the most part, I didn't think it would be possible to give it up because I thought my brain was just this place of chaos and overwhelm. And so I needed something. So everybody gets some sort of coping mechanism when you right. don't understand or have the tools to manage your own mind, then Absolutely. you're being managed by it. So alcohol for me was a very socially acceptable way to cope with the stress and anxiety. And then because alcohol is, has addictive properties, it's kind of like the frog that gets into the cold water and slowly over time, 
my brain formed a habit around it where less and less options to relax. Like I yeah. could do other things, but that's the habit formation. It's just the collapse of the options and you get a default of, well, I need a drink. Absolutely. Once upon a time, I said, I need to relax. What do I do? Okay. Alcohol is an option, but that collapsed into a habit and I needed a drink. And then over time, my tolerance grew. And so it just became harder and harder to control. How do we respond to that? We think there's something wrong with us, absolutely. especially with alcohol. There's such a bipolar stigma, right? Like it's oh, the absolutely. best thing. It's celebratory. You deserve it. But God forbid you have a few too many drinks, go directly to AA, you're an alcoholic and, <laughs> you know, right, make right. amends to everybody. And this is, so it's, it's these frameworks that create all this stigma. So I hid it in shame for a long time because I didn't want to admit that I had a problem because I thought that meant. I guess I have to go to rehab. Like I wasn't sure um, of, of what that meant. And so I hit it. And then of course, as we all do, something takes us to our knees and right. I decided to stop drinking completely. And that was amazing. I mean, there is no day wasted if you're not pouring alcohol on it. But what I didn't realize is that I had, I had identified as somebody who couldn't control my mind, then I identified as an alcoholic. And all of these belief systems were robbing me of my autonomy, my right. power to design a life I don't need to escape, as well as design a brain I didn't need to escape. And so over time, I realized all of that. And that's when I decided to help women take the third door, which is, you know, keep drinking and struggling in, in shame and silence or quit drinking forever and struggle in shame and being open about it. Or none of that matters. Alcohol, it's very normal to get addicted to an addictive substance, mm -hmm. especially when you're dealing with a co a, a coexisting condition like ADHD and that there are ways that you can learn to drink again so that alcohol is a pleasure but it's not breaking the habit of drinking that you're doing. It's creating habits of coping with your brain and learning how to relax instead of thinking that you need alcohol to reduce your stress. I love that. And I love the way you framed it because there are so many things that we do to cope and to manage our ADHD challenges and our ADHD symptoms. And some of them because become positive adaptations and some of them become like harmful adaptations or coping mechanisms. And, you know, it's the same, very, very similar sort of cycle that we see in clients or those of us with ADHD that use brinkmanship to get themselves to do something right. Like the only way they know how to do something is to bring themselves to that, you know, the deadline or the crisis or whatever, you know, that I call it the crash and burn cycle, delay, delay, avoid mad, panicked rush. Um, there's the screen issue, right? I see, I see the parallels, right? Those of us who don't know how to relax, don't know how to disconnect, um, turn our brains down or slow them down or, or check out, um, you know, whatever, put your boundaries, close up shop is what I'm trying to say, Colleen, you know, kind of end your day and move on to the rest of your day or how to get yourself to do things when you, you know, aren't feeling motivated or, or, or aren't feeling inspired or don't know how to get started. And we disappear into our screens. That becomes yeah. a maladaptive coping mechanism like so many other, I mean, you know, it really just about anything can become a maladaptive coping mechanism mm -hmm. if you're using it in a, in the wrong way. And in a way that takes you from having control over yourself and over your life. And I think that's such an important thing to remember. Yeah. It's important to understand that habits are normal and that whatever you are rinsing and repeating is forming a habit yep. and it gets harder and harder to escape that habit. You know, and one thing I, I liked about what you said that I'd like to pinpoint is that when we wait to change yeah. or uh, think we have to be forced into change, there's two sources of motivation. One is the pursuit of pleasure and one is the avoidance of pain. And when you have a maladaptive coping mechanism and it's you're associating it with shame, that pain is growing and growing. The mm -hmm. problem, as those of us who know how dopamine works, the problem is that motivating yourself, attaching your dopamine so that your brain thinks what you want, attaching that to the pain 
it becomes a bit of a pickle because the better you do and the more confident you feel, the less motivated you are to worry about, you know, right. the maladaptive coping right. mechanism and we're back. <laughs> Absolutely. And so that, that creates this cycle of starting over and beating yourself up, which reinforces this idea that you can't control yourself. What I teach women in terms of, and men, of course, but women are in my program. It's gender neutral advice. Let's say that what I teach is that the real habit that needs to change for any maladaptive coping mechanism is the way you respond to yourself after you fall into the behavior. This idea that there's going to be enough willpower for you to override the subconscious belief for the rest of your life, which means if you promise yourself hard enough that you're not going to do it anymore, that then you have to commit to never feeling distressed or distracted or focus on anything else because you're going to spend the rest of your life doing that. Like that is that is that perfectionistic performance driven metric based mm -hmm. mindset that is actually what perpetuates maladaptive behaviors Absolutely. especially alcohol and what needs to change this is why i refer to myself as the hangover whisperer the change that needs to be made is never how much you drank or scrolled or ate the ice cream last night it's how you respond in the moment because when you respond by beating yourself up you're reinforcing in your brain the idea that you can't control it, that you are yes. a failure. Yes. And so that actually perpetuates the problem. The solution, high level simple, is to become a learner and to think of every experience as like an iteration, as, as one experiment to see what worked and what didn't work right. and to constantly be learning how to design your life to set your future self up for success, for success, instead of sitting there beating your past self up for being lazy, weak, horrible, stupid, and never going to get into failure, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I often say, and if any listeners that have been with me for a while, you know, this is going to sound familiar, but I often say that like, anytime you find yourself in that blame and shame cycle, anytime you're beating yourself up, you can't be in an analytical problem solving frame of mind at the same time. So you can't be learning about what works. You can't be observing. You can't be analyzing. You can't be like putting changes in place that are, that are going to help you for the rest of your life. So learning to break that blame and shame cycle and shift into that, you know, curious observer, um, analytical problem solver, I call it in my program, the in shifting into your engineering perspective so that you can learn what works for you and do more of it. Again, it can't happen if you're in that blame and shame spiral and in that blame and shame cycle. That's how we, we, we start to believe that the only choice is, you know, kind of this habit or this behavior that we've created as a response. You, you don't see it. You, it, you, you know, you can't see it. You can't make those changes until you can make that shift. And that's huge. One of the ways I help people like I boil it down to this. It is the illusion of failure that has to be broken. You cannot fail like at being you. You cannot fail at experiencing something. You cannot fail to learn. Your brain's always learning. So you can direct it or you can allow <laughs> it to be directed by these subconscious fears, right? You haven't failed. Your strategy has failed. Yes. And that's when you can kind of dis dis disconnect and work through the emotions that are perpetuating the habit. But if you could see yourself in a learning process and know it's not possible to fail, like I, I teach my women to say, stop saying like, I can't trust myself right. and to start saying something that feels a little more true. Like I trust myself to learn, like I trust myself tonight to go to this party and for sure I'm going to learn. I'm either going to learn what I did right, or I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm going to learn where I could have done better. Like right. have a sense of humor and compassion. You can't fail. You can only learn. I love that. I love that. You get to define failure, right? You get to choose what you call a failure failure, and what you don't, but it all starts with awareness. So you, what would you say, Colleen, is the, like the biggest mistake people make when they realize they have some concerns about how they're drinking or their concerns about alcohol and, and it becoming a maladaptive coping mechanism? Well, um, 
I, I would almost go with two at this point because okay. the first mistake we've really already covered. And that is okay. a black or white thing. The first mistake is to ask yourself if you're an alcoholic. Okay. That's the first mistake is to internalize okay. this as a you problem versus a strategy or a lack of knowledge. And so the second thing is that the big mistake is that people think alcohol is a food group and it's, and they don't understand that it was a drug, that it is a drug. It's a biphasic drug. And so understanding that a little bit of alcohol has the exact opposite effect of a large amount and that that line, there's a biphasic line of 0.055 blood alcohol level. Anything that you drink up until then can be, but not always, it depends on your day, can make you feel better, makes you feel warm and stimulated and talkative, but relaxed. The more you drink beyond the 0.055 blood level, the more the negative side effects compound. What are those negative side effects? Well, it, it really affects dopamine. Alcohol spikes your dopamine higher than normal everyday activities. This is the habit. This is the lure of the habit. The problem, as we know with dopamine, is anything that spikes your dopamine causes it to go below baseline levels the next day, which creates a, a discrepancy between how you think you should feel and how you want to feel, and your brain's busy learning. How do we fix that? I know we can pour a drink. And so understanding that the more you drink alcohol and you don't give yourself space between uses to allow the baseline levels to come back up, especially if you exceeded that 0.055. From my experience, if I had a glass of wine or something and I don't exceed that, um, if, or if I don't even get close to it, I don't experience a drop in dopamine that is discernible. But people who are regular drinkers, the more you drink on a regular basis, the more that's affecting your dopamine levels. So understanding that your cravings for alcohol, relanguage that. You're not craving alcohol. You're craving dopamine. And beyond that, you're craving stress relief and you're craving a relief from the chaos and the overwhelm in your brain. So the biggest mistakes, if I could put them back to back, is asking the question, am I an alcoholic? And then thinking that you're actually craving dopamine. The body doesn't crave alcohol, excuse me, thinking that you're craving alcohol. The body doesn't crave alcohol. The body craves water and sleep and good nutrition. So stop telling yourself a story and getting caught in that social construct that there's such a thing as an alcoholic and that you might be one of them and sending yourself down the wrong rabbit hole. That's really powerful. And for those of you who just like a quick refresher, right? Don't, we talk a lot about dopamine in the ADHD world. There are other brain chemicals that are involved or um, impacted by ADHD, but dopamine is a big one. It's the neurotransmitter that is responsible for feelings of motivation, feelings of reward, right? Feelings of reward that reinforce the behaviors and the things that we want to do and want to repeat. So it's difficult for us because we pro process dopamine differently to feel motivated, to feel feelings of reward, to reinforce the things that we want to reinforce. And anytime you're doing anything that's messing with your dopamine, um, that's not a good thing, right? That's, we don't need that extra help, you know, and I'm saying that sarcastically, it's not, it's not extra help in the long run, right? So that sort of dopamine crash that you have that next day, you know, you're really setting yourself up to struggle even more. And that's, I think that's an important thing to under, understand. I wasn't aware of that biphasic nature of alcohol. That's, that's really, I mean, that's really powerful. I think. It's also forgiving, you know, you should always trust your experience, the truth of your body. The body doesn't lie versus what the brain thinks. So Absolutely. even just hearing that, but I know from my own experience, heavy drinking for over 20 years of my life and occasional use now, like I don't feel a dopamine blip when I keep it to one, one and a half glasses of wine. And I very much enjoy it. And I have no desire because I now know how to manage my mind too. I'm not using the alcohol to solve a problem. I'm yeah. just enjoying myself socially and a little bit goes a long way. Yeah, that's huge. That's really huge. Anything else you want to share with our audience? Just that the best thing that you can do if you are struggling is to get it, find some help or a trusted person to speak to, because it is 
more so than the alcohol, the primary problem is the shame yes. associated and the identity. And it's these secrets that make you sick and you're not failing. Your strategy is failing. And if you don't like this strategy, someone's given you such as, you know, an, a uh, AA meeting or some other 12 step program, like those work for some people, but your experience is your truth. And if they don't yeah. work for you, don't give up on yourself and internalize yourself as a failure. Keep looking, keep, you know, check out my podcast. It's not about the alcohol. There's tons of resources. And there's other of us out here who are paving a more moderate, forgiving approach to alcohol, your brain absolutely can heal. And that's the other thing, you know, in the, in the sober world, once an addict, always an addict. And, and once your brain is changed, then you can't change back bullshit, neuroplasticity <laughs> within six months, you are actually stronger in the self-regulation department than you were prior to, or than other people who are have never struggled with an addiction. So healing is possible. Just get yourself a strategy that works for you and get out of your head and, and get moving on it. Absolutely. I love that, right? There's nothing wrong with you and who you are as a person. This is not a moral character problem. It's a strategy problem. I think yes. that's a really important thing to remember. So yeah. tell our listeners one more time where they can see what you're up to, learn more about what you do, connect with you. It's not about the alcohol is the name of my podcast. And I'm at hangover whisperer on TikTok, and I'm at the hangover Whis over whisperer on Instagram. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Colleen. This has been really informative and I'm really hoping this is very helpful for, for some of our listeners. Um, please join us in the ADHD support talk, Facebook group. If you have ideas, thoughts, questions about this, um, if you want to connect with us and, and ask other kinds of questions, suggestions for topics, guests, that sort of thing, we'd love to have you in our community. If you found the podcast helpful, you, if you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate it. If you'd leave, leave us a five-star review on iTunes, the more five-star reviews we get, the more people can find us and get the help and support they need to live well with their ADHD. So thank you again, Colleen. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate you joining us and sharing your wisdom and your, your expertise with our listeners. And thank you all for listening. As always, I appreciate your attention. We'll catch you next time on ADHD Support Talk.